All right, it looks like we're live. I'm waiting for the timer to kick in and make sure. There we go. Okay. All right, I'm seeing that we're live. So welcome everyone to our uh, panel session discussion uh, group chat that we're having today, where we're going to talk about uh, a Wandavision curriculum. So this is really geared towards people who like Wandavision and people who are educators who want to think about. And of course, we can talk about who's an educator, maybe all of us. So I'll start off by saying, uh, just introducing myself. Um, so my name is Dan Kretka. I'm at the University of North Texas. I was previously a high school social studies teacher. Now I'm a social in social study teacher ed. And the question I think we're all going to, we can introduce ourselves by a little bit is, which WandaVision character has your energy? Um, and I'll pull up the GIF in a little bit here, but I'm going to go with, so I've got two answers, right? This is going to be complicated today. And I think WandaVision is complicated, right? One is Darcy. I just, I like that Darcy's always trying to figure things out. I like the gif of her, the little clip where she's like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I felt a lot like that during the show. And which is fun. I think that's kind of what school and education is supposed to be about is that you don't have to always know answers and you're working towards them. Um, and uh, so I like that. The other side of me, I want, I guess I aspire to kind of be as sincere as Vision is with my students. I appreciate his sincerity. And so I think that's that's something I could take away. So I'm excited to, to not just talk about, you know, um, the, the, the educational aspects, but just the show. I've got stuff to say. So um, let me pass it on. I'm just going to go the, in the direction that I see people. Let me pass it on to Catherine Van Kessel. Hi everyone. Um, my name is yeah Catherine Van Kessel, and uh, currently I'm an assistant professor in the Faculty of Education at the University of Alberta in Canada. So I'm the lone Canadian up here. Um, yeah, I I love this kind of thing. I love talking about pop culture. Um, I love talking about evil, and One Division has has both of those things. Um, like Dan, I really connected with Darcy. Um, I kind of see myself as the sassy friend, but someone who doesn't want to be constrained by identification of the sassy friend. <laughs> and also, um, I really like how she gets wrapped up in her work. Like she's sitting in front of the television with popcorn and she's like really getting into it. Uh, and I find in my in my teaching and my research, like I, I fall into that rabbit hole. Okay, so you have to tell us now uh, which WandaVision character has your energy. It's Darcy. You said Darcy already, right? So it's the same. Okay, sorry. I was getting it set up. Okay, let's go to Marie next. Marie Heath. Hi, I'm Marie Heath, and I am an assistant professor at Loyola University in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, and I also love, I love puzzle shows. I got into Lost. I got into Game of Thrones. I, I love an extended, complicated, in-universe story. I'm I'm into that. Um, so I loved WandaVision for that. Um, and I also really liked uh, that the story was about Wanda's grief. Um, and that kind of brings me to the character that I identify with. I, I lost my dad right before lockdown last year. And I felt like for the this show, I identified with Wanda a lot. I felt that. I felt the complexity and the well, we'll talk more about it, I think. Um, but interestingly, I asked my family this question on a group text we have. I have three kids and a husband. And my husband said Darcy. And my kids all said Agnes. So I'll just leave that there. That's Don't ask this question of people that are in your family unless you're prepared for like some hard truths about the way they see you. All right, let's go to uh, Michael Milton. Hello, am I on? Like you can hear me? Perfect, good, I was having an issue earlier. Um, my name is Michael Milton, I'm a high school teacher in Massachusetts, very excited to be here. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I too enjoy the show. I'm very excited you talked about Lost. I'm doing a rewatch of Lost right now because I really do. That's like the great, oh, I love it. This all oh, the theories and whatnot. Uh, in terms of like character identification, I would love to say uh, Jimmy Wu. I love him. He is uh, fantastic. But if I were to be really honest, I would be the mailman, Dennis the mailman. I think we have very similar energy. Um, so that's kind of where I am on that.
Sorry, my mute button is is slow registering when I press it. Uh, and so last but not least, and I don't know, we're going to have to see who has the most Marvel uh, uh, knowledge here, but I feel like Danelle can put up with anyone because she's kind of taught me a little bit as I've gotten into Marvel. I'm new to it. I would consider myself a casual in that I'm just MCU. I don't know the clicks. So uh, Danelle Adeniji, welcome. Thank you for having me here. I am so excited. My name is Danelle Adeniji. Um, like I've been in Marvel deep for a decade. Like I got in when the first Thor came out, but even before then the comics. And so I, it's always a spoiler to watch the comics versus the movie. And I feel like that's low key a part of my feelings about this show. So once again, I love anything Marvel with an asterisk. I don't like Iron Man or Black Widow. They're pointless to me, but I can talk about that forever. Um, I know we'll go deeper into this, but I don't know how I feel about the show because the finale overshadowed a lot of my feelings. And my energy is Monica Rambeau. Like she came in strong, like I'm back. What we doing? Let's do this. I got to, you know, I got to help her out. You know, let's avenge. Um, let's avenge Wanda. Wanda, what's going on? Why do you want to kill her? You're slimy, you know? And then, yeah, I love Monica. So, so, so maybe we could, maybe we could start there, right? So before we get into like our more, you know, specific connections to education. You know, I think one of the things that's that's fun about shows like this is they develop kind of fan cultures around them, right? And I, I've kind of gotten into a little bit. I've been watching the YouTube videos of the people who are experts and I've been reading the message boards a bit more. And so, and I, by the way, when the show started, I watched all the MCU movies. Um, and so I've watched all the movies and done that. So I'm, I'm getting really into this world. And there's these Wait, fan- In the span of what time can you tell us? I would like that on the record. Too short. I have an addictive personality. I'm I'm the person who watches it. Like I stayed up and watched it right when it came out. So <laughs> that's where I'm at. So I think the thing that's interesting is also like, and Henry Jenkins and others have wrote about this in education about how like we have these kind of like online space, fan culture spaces that develop um, that are really like creative and interesting. But I think the fan, a lot of the people deep in that were let down. Right, Danelle, and I don't know if that's part of what you're conveying is that a lot of the comic book stuff didn't come true. A lot of the, the the clues that seemed to be there didn't come through. So I guess just the question of like, before we get into like more specific educational ties is is I guess like, what what is interest a show like this for edu We're all in education, we're all educators. Like what are we all interested in when we watch this show? Danelle, you said the characters, right? Like you were kind of invested in in Monica Rambo, right, specifically. Is that what's driving you for other people? What are people into about this show? I can start. Uh, for me, okay, I'm not a huge Wanda Vision fan. Uh, Wanda Vision coupling, like them as a couple, I get it, but it's just like, what? So when once you're in Marvel, you gotta watch everything. Like, even if you don't want to watch it, you have to watch everything because the way they set up, they drop Easter eggs. And if you miss something, then you miss the whole thing. So I'm invested in the Easter eggs and seeing the continual story. And um, I think I answered your question. <laughs> I also really like the, the mystery aspect of it. I spent a lot of um, my colleagues and I a lot of afternoons uh, after the students left talking about it, trying to trade, trading theories, trying to figure out like, who are they tracking? They're, they can't be tracking uh, vision because they have vision. Who are they like? Um, and so we spent a lot of time. And so, yeah, at the end it was like, oh, okay, we're just not gonna do that. That's fine. Um, I also have very specific questions about taxes, but we're not gonna get into that. But does vision pay taxes? <laughs> is he a person? Does he like, who pays vision? Um, does he save? Also, what does he spend money on besides this house in New Jersey? And I apologize, um, but um, some of those, uh, I would like to know who does the taxes for the Avengers and, and if and how they get paid. <laughs> I like it. And the, we need to explore the economics of WandaVision a bit more. And not just on the show, but we have a comment here, but how it how, talked about how Marvel cashes in on making more movies without using the show to maybe hint at those comic references. Um, I thought that was interesting. We have a lot of good comments already happening. 
And then David pointed out when we discuss the discussion is to think how Mana did all of that while suppressing her own grief, right? It's really interesting because I think one of some of the explanations I saw at the end with this was a show about Wanda, right? Like this is this is a show primarily about her. And that was kind of an excuse to talk about how, I mean, it really centered her grief in such deep ways. But Monica just like lost her mom and we learned that in the show and where was her grief, right? Um, and so, yeah, so the, the ways it, yeah, there's a lot going on. I don't know, what did other people think? Uh, I'll say, I think Dan, you and I might have talked about this at the very beginning, you know, that this is Monica's, or sorry, uh, Wanda's grief. And she goes sort of, she binge watches and goes into the suburbs to, you know, like the white 1950 suburbs to deal with her grief and to sort of lose herself in her grief. And when Monica shows up and she says, you don't belong here and throws her out, I was like, oh, maybe maybe we won't have like a white feminist take on her grief. Maybe we'll have like, this will lead to a larger conversation. And then at the end, when Monica says like, I understand why you did, I was so mad at that. I was so mad that was the line that Monica had. I would have done the same. No, you didn't. You wouldn't have done this. I don't believe she would have done the same thing. And I had a real problem with that wrapping up. They did this like nuanced, thoughtful. I was like, this is going to be really cool. It's going to be a really nuanced, thoughtful portrayal of grief, plus puzzles, plus all this stuff. And then it ended like that. And I was like, oh, it didn't do what I, what I wanted it to do. Same. They dropped the ball on Monica. She came in hot. Here I am. Darcy's like, if you go through this one more time, it's going to, it's changing your whole DNA. So we get to see Monica in her greatness and then they reduce her to like the black friend. Here's a shoulder. Here you go. I took care of your kids. I birthed your kids. Okay. Bye. Yes, yeah, it's about it Wanda, but what about, like you said, Monica's grief. Like we saw that transformation when she went through the field again and they just said, nah, we're good. Well, there's even, even at the way when she took the bullets, right? Like it's like having the only black character have to take the bullets from, you know, federal law enforcement. Um, and there's yeah. kind of notion, you know, about like pain and black pain and how it's represented. And I thought, so I thought that was really, and then just that whole thing, I think if I, I, have come to more in terms with just accepting the show what it was. I went through a phase. I've already gone through multiple phases on how I feel about the end episode, uh, but I've let myself accept it. But one thing was that, yeah, the Tyler Hayward shooting at the end and Monica accepting the bullet, that whole exchange didn't make a ton of sense. Like also just even him jumping out of the car and starting to shooting at children, right? I was like, uh, that's a quite an acceleration of things. And his character just ended up being not as developed and I thought I thought they would do more with where he was going to. And he just was kind of like kind of bad. But also, I think a larger issue, which maybe Catherine, maybe this is a, a segue into talking a little bit about the notions of evil on the show. Right. You put out a poll on Twitter that asked who is that? What? I, I'm, how did you word it? Who is evil? Who is the villain on this show? And you gave us Hayward, uh, Wanda and and uh, Agatha Harkness. So do you want to, I mean, help us work through that? Because I think it is really interesting because at the end you do start to ask questions about all of those characters. And I had mixed feelings. Yeah, and right, rightfully so. Um, Cause definitely that's what, I mean, initially I was drawn into this show just because I thought it was neat that each episode was a different decade. And I was like, oh, that's like this show and that, you know, whatever. But being uh, a researcher of evil, obviously that's where I zoned in on. So yeah, I, I was really interested now. Of course, I didn't think to put out the poll earlier. So I just did this morning. So I, I only had, I think like 13 or 14 people respond to the poll, but um, the vast majority had Tyler as the most evil. Cause I, I didn't ask if one was evil or not, but who's the most evil? Because in my mind, all three are different forms of evil. So like, um, WandaVision starts out and there's no villain. You know, the first couple of episodes, it's just kind of sitcom or, or whatever. And then we start getting a little bit more and more and more and more. And then by the end, we have like, you have Agatha who is very cartoonish. She's cartoonishly evil, uh, which makes her character hilarious and enjoyable in lots of ways. But I mean, it's a pretty simplistic view of evil. Like, oh, she's a witch, wah, ha, ha, ha. I'm going to go get your things and whatever. And with Tyler, you're sort of like, he's he sort of fits the, you know, also with simplistic evil, although a different form where, you know, he's sort of like, okay, you he's the good guy, but he's, 
jaded by his experiences and he's not thinking about the repercussions of his actions. Um, and like to me, aside from the finale, which threw me for a bit of a loop as well, like he's kind of like a banal evil where he's doing his job and there's, he's just, he's, it's not that he's not thinking, but he's being like really thoughtless about it. So I see him from like a Hannah Arendt point of view. So he's like, you know, okay, sure, fine. That's okay. But Wanda, like Wanda is the kind of evil that I think we need to really look at because we empathize with her. Like if, if I was doing this poll, like on a, on a wider scale, um, you know, and I asked people like, do you have like feelings in your heart, <laughs> in your body for Wanda? And like, of course, many people would, you know, because that's what the script writers want. They want us to empathize with her. We, her grief is made very plain to us. Her, you know, they go back to her childhood and losing her parents and her brother and then vision like twice and, you know, all these sorts of things. So like, we feel really bad for her. But at the same time, I mean, she enslaved people, <laughs> you know, like that's so bad. <laughs> so she should be cartoonishly evil, but she's portrayed like our friend, like our sister, like our aunt. We feel complicated things. So like we're in this really gross space where we have to condemn her actions. Oh my goodness. But we feel other things as well. And this is so useful because these are what real people are to us every day. You know, Hitler was someone's uncle. You know, we have pictures of him, you know, playing with dogs and kissing babies and chatting on the phone with buddies. You know, for us, he's cartoonishly evil, but for people at the time, like he was this guy that they knew and, and therefore didn't maybe take us seriously. So it makes me angry that Wanda, like, I mean, I, I think that whole scene with Monica where Monica's like, you know, I would have done it too. Like, I mean, I think that's garbage. That should have just not been in there. But aside from that, like, I'm actually re really intrigued by the storyline where she's not punished by that, where we are led to be sympathetic to her. Because if we dive into that, then I think we're getting somewhere with similar processes, whether that's the people who worked in residential schools um, who were thought they were doing good, right? And yet, all of this, you know, cellar colonial violence or, you know, um, uh, people who enslaved others who were like trying to be like the good, you know, I took care of them. And you're like, ah, you're still enslaved them, <laughs> you know? So it, it lets us sit with what's, um, what are those very real situations that are continually unfolding and having cascading effects today? Oh my gosh, I just thought of like a Thomas Jefferson, like Wanda, like comparison, <laughs> like, right? Like, oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> if you read this, like the, the Stamped Remix book, the nice take for, for young students, right, on Thomas Jefferson. And he comes off as, as, as you know, I mean, I think because a lot of the Wanda's evilness, right, rests on whether she knew what she was doing, um, which, like, I think historically a lot of, well, I'd love, love to hear that, right? Like, I think at the end, that's like the legal claim. Is she, I didn't know this was happening, right? Like, it's like a claim. That's like the claim that's out there, which, by the way, kind of exonerates, uh, Hayward, in a sense, right? Because if she, if when you're thinking about it at the end there, he's coming in, he's trying to break up like the her controlling this town. Like, what is wrong with that? He should be trying to do that, right? Um, anyway, so that's where he becomes more complicated until the very end when he just does a clearly evil thing. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I saw you saying maybe, maybe not. What do you do? Well, I just mean, just, to, not, just to pop in for, for a quick sec, like we we do have to think of like whether intention counts or not, you know, or is it the effect? Or is it both? And there's no right answer to that for sure. But like, it's like, does it matter? You know, like the, the people who are part of residential schools had good intentions. They weren't really aware of what they're doing, but maybe should they have been? And I mean, they're super tough questions. Um, and yeah, like, I mean, all the philosophers would like fight about this, like for Kant, like intention was super important um, in, in these different kind of ways. But it's, uh, I think there's, um, if we separate a person from being evil as an action, it makes it easier. Right. So it's not, you know, I was playing with my poll a little bit like so it's not is Wanda evil, but it's which of those actions are evil. And then that allows us to sit in that complexity a little bit further. So, yeah, it wasn't intentional. She she wasn't. And so sucks for her. But it's the action itself is still evil. I don't know. Maybe. But what do other people think? I don't know. Like maybe uh, I'm just ranting here. Well, I'll point you to a good comment we had from from the chat. Right. That, that that's the same way it happens in 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 the comics, right? You kind of empathize with her, but she basically is committing a form of genocide, right? Which 
is kind of what our history books have done is they've empathized with people who who created incredible violence towards others. So to Catherine's point, what do what the rest of you think? Oh, um, exactly. And I wrote down impact over intentions because those who have enslaved and those who have done evil acts, who suffers? It's the people on the other side that is often forgotten about. People are like, well, like you said, I took care of them. I gave them somewhere to eat, to live. I fed them food. You know, and Wanda, well, they have the right to choose to do whatever they want. But what got me every single time in the show is when they would break the wall. Is this okay? Is this how you want it? And then at the end, uh, the 70s show, Mom, can you please let us go? If you don't let us go, kill us, please or just let us die. And it was at that point that I realized she legit enslaved a whole town. And then she just walked away with Jimmy Woo. Um, <clears throat> I just I just forgot her name. Uh, with Jimmy Woo, Monica, and everybody else to clean up her mess. She gets to go chill in the hills and with all this water and study her magic in the back while the townspeople are left with PTSD. So, you know, impact over intentions. And yes, in the comics, like Wanda loses her mind a lot and she takes it out on a lot of people. And people always have to pay for her actions. She doesn't take responsibility. So that definitely feeds into the narrative that we live in today. Danelle, did you read the House of M? No, but I read- um, You read a synopsis? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I've always, so I know that it starts off because I have the, I ended up finding, I had the first issue in, in my, um, in my, in the back, um, but I didn't have anything else. And I was really, but it begins with like, actually it's the X-Men and the Avengers coming together to say, listen, we need to, we need to kill her. Um, but then I, cause the, cause she is creating this alternate reality and who knows how, how big it could get. Um, and then she's taken away by her uh, father, uh, who's not in this uh, series, but it's uh, Magneto, um, and uh, but I don't know what happens at the end. Danell, what, ha what happens at the end of House of M? If you remember, well, although on the Magneto part, I will add their their costumes. Their uh, you know their her new outfit looks awfully like Magneto's in X Men. So if you didn't catch it, like exact same shades, colors, but. At this point, you can't trust the people making these movies that, that those connections mean anything. Um, sorry, but Michael was asking you a question, Danelle. I don't remember. Let me go read again. But um, like how it started, like they, like you said, they wanted to kill her. They wanted to take her out. So she flipped reality and gave Magneto what he wanted, power and everything. Cause, and then like people start to wake up and realize this is not real. So I'm gonna go find that because, you know, people are tripping over, oh, she's more power than the, than the, than the uh, Supreme Sorcerer. But I think we really need to evaluate Wanda's mental stability. I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't agree with, I don't agree with taking somebody out, but realistically, something needs to happen. So it's kind of like well, who watches the Watchmen? That's right. Uh, like Reva said, in the she uh, she races like over ninety percent of mutants, mm -hmm. and so then they start to live. Yeah, she starts to erase people, and then it becomes even more chaotic. And then she's like recognizes what she's done once again because somebody else pointed it out. So well, I'm sorry, I cut you off, Michael. You're good. You're good. And to your point, I mean, there's history movies on this, right? Like this notion, should we take her out? I mean, Valkyrie, for example, is just one example that taught the movie with Tom Cruise, where it's literally about the plot to kill Hitler. And most will accept that premise that it's OK to kill Hitler. Right. Um, and so I think it's really interesting. This is and maybe this is because we let uh, Dr. Evil lead us. Um, into this, but we're really having a discussion of morality and in and, and, and good and evil, which I'm very curious, like how often do we get to do that in schools? And this is, I think this kind of debate, right? The, so one of the, the biggest like challenges I think with taking this stuff into school is not ruining it, 
right? Like, like I think you can easily be like, oh, I'm going to adapt this stuff that we, that this Marvel universe and we're going to do it in schools. And then all of a sudden the kids are like, oh, I have a multiple choice test on it. Oh, I have to do this. Like, I don't, that's not what I want it, right? So it can go wrong really quickly. And so I think the question is how can you explore? But to me, this is the type of discussion that I think kids would be very interested in. I don't know. Do we have, do you all think like this is, like this is an example of where like the Marvel Cinematic Universe and WandaVision really offer something that is hard to get at. Cause I just don't think I get to have many discussions about evil and morality in my classes. I don't know what do other people think or, or other connections or ignore everything I just said. I like it. I agree, Dan. I don't, I don't think that we do except that again, and I don't think I said this in my introduction, but I also have a social studies background. I was a social studies teacher before um, I went into ed tech and social studies. And so you know, I think the way that we just had this conversation about laying over sort of, you know, if starting even so you start with like what kids might know in the WandaVision universe or the MCU and then kind of pull that in and start, you know, even a sort of like, so where you fall on this argument? OK, then let's have this discussion here. Who are the parallels? You know, who's got who's got the WandaVision energy? in whatever we're studying and then see if you can draw parallels that way. So I think that that would be an interesting way to use it and still have those conversations. I really like to have um, students uh, have like a spectrum of evil. So like picking characters. So like, I think WandaVision is a great example just because, you know, as I started off talking about, we have like three very different kind of forms of evil and like what's worse and why. And of course, no right answer, but that discussion is where you get at something that's really cool that I, you know, it's hard to find that in the superhero genre. I mean, it does exist. Um, like I think Thanos was really interesting um, because he was like, it was to this end of almost like sustainability. Right. Um, but the thing is, is unlike Wanda, I mean, he's not uh, a beautiful, like, well, conventionally beautiful woman um, who we've been kind of led on this. Like for Thanos, we were sort of like, oh, he's got a point and that makes me feel weird. But it's just a moment. Whereas Wanda kind of draws that out. And I think and I think we could do that with, you know, any media that students are really engaged with. Um, you know, I've done it with like Harry Potter and with Star Wars and so on. And like, how does the backstory change your opinion of these people or not? You know, so knowing Wanda's background, does that change how you feel about her? Again, being very careful never to excuse the actions, but just being like, how are you how are you thinking about this? I definitely use Thanos as a, uh, when we were talking about um, capitalism and uh, Malthus, because uh, it's a Malthusian argument. Uh, and so we definitely talked about Thanos uh, as the Avengers were, um, you know, raving up to uh, the end. Although I don't know if I haven't, uh, yeah. If I can, um, I liked the point that you were making. It offers discussions about, you know, morals. What is right and wrong? What do we think? Who deserves to have certain privileges. And to the talk about Thanos, I always say that Thanos, Killmonger, out of these people weren't villains, especially Killmonger, because these are humanitarian efforts to survive. Now their survival, Thanos' survival was extreme, but Killmonger, he wanted to see people live. So. Killmonger is one of my favorite so-called villains of all time because he's like, I mean, someone could do a dissertation just on him, like the complexities that are woven in and you're just like, but he's right there. And you're like, but I don't feel good about that. But then here and then there. Oh, yeah. Oh, mwah. <laughs> Yeah, and we have a comment here too. Um, uh, David kept, he said, I kept wondering if comparing Wanda's enslavement of others and lack of knowledge of her power to the idea of white privilege and how the lack of understanding that privilege is still problematic. Right? And you can really easily view uh, Wanda's story as a, as a settler colonial story too, right? I mean, she literally like isn't from the neighborhood, comes in, immediately takes over everything and, and controls everyone. And we still like write about her as an explorer, right? In the textbooks, right? She's an explorer, not a colonizer, not a, a villain, right? And so you can kind of see that. All right, if we can, if we could pivot a little, I have a, I'd love to discuss the sitcom component of the show. Cause I'll tell you like, 
that's my favorite part of the show. The first few episodes where you don't fully know what's going on. I think sitcoms are such an interesting, uh, I, I really love that, like leaning into that because it's like, it's kind of an inception, multiple level layer, right? Like we're all watching a television show to maybe, you know, on some level escape all the, the stuff that's happening in our lives and the, and the world kind of slowly falling apart <laughs> right all around us. Um, and, and it's kind of a form of distraction. And so I thought a lot about um, Neil Postman's like Amusing Ourselves to Death. If you've never read that, it's a 1980s book that really focuses a lot on the spectacle of television and how it really distorts reality. And that a major problem in society is that as television has become an increasingly prominent medium or the most dominant medium, that often we are kind of in a distracted state where we can't address the real things and we escape to that. And I often use it as a comparison to uh, Soma in Brave New World, the, like the medicine people take to just stay happy and ignore the reality and the things that are happening. And so I thought, but then also like there's just a level of history of sitcoms, right? Which I think would be super interesting to think how like, like that's something that's relevant to kids and students and adults that we don't analyze much, right? Like how does TV change over the decades and what does it mean for like our understandings of society? And so I don't know. And it's interesting. She starts in this fifties American dream, you know, that we all know it, it's concealing a lot. When you watch those sitcoms, the world seems great. That's probably what a lot of uh, conservatives mean when they say like the good old days, probably thinking of sitcoms uh, and ignoring like the reality of segregation and all and all of the things that were happening. So I'd love to hear how you all think about the sitcoms, because I think that could be a great lesson to talk about, to talk through TV and media history. I don't know. Did, any, did that capture anyone else? It, it sure did for me, because uh, one of the things I'm really interested in is how like these how sitcoms in general, as well as this parody of a sitcom, like you talked about it distorting reality. But I think we also have to consider have to consider how it's creating reality. And this is why I like Sean Baudrillard so much, because it's, you know, yeah, there were like some gender roles that they were drawing from to create the sitcom, but the sitcom in turn creates those those roles. And, it, and eventually you get into kind of a chicken and egg kind of thing. Um, like Baudrillard thought Disneyland was, you know, people think that that's fake, but he thinks it's in many ways more real than American society. It, um, just because of this, like it's this sort of simulacrum that is then creating what we think we're actually experiencing. And like, of course, like wording this is really hard because I'm really trying hard not to use the word like real and reality and so on. But I, I think that that's like super interesting, uh, especially in the final episode where Vision and Vision are talking and they actually bring up the, sh the ship of Theseus and like, okay, well, if you replace it plank by plank as the woods ro wood rots, like, is it still the ship of Theseus or it, are the discarded parts or if they're reassembled or are both real or are neither real and, and so on. And I, I think we're only going to get somewhere when we see this reality, like anything resembling a reality as being only in relation to people. Like not necessarily that it has to be the boards that Theseus touched, but like how are people relating to it? How are they making sense of it? And so like thinking about education, like we talk about real world problems in math and it's like, well, hmm, yeah, yes and yes and no and in history and with critical thinking, like we're trying to delve at a reality that we're like uncovering in lots of ways, like thinking that there's some kind of like, I don't know, true form or or something. And so I think like it would be neat to have students watch scenes where reality, you're sort of, you're, you're put a bit, you're destabilized maybe is a better word in terms of the reality, like her children. Her children are a fabrication, a fabulation. And yet to her, they're very real. Those feelings are real and, and those kind of things. And so like there's a stuff being created that's maybe just as real as something else. Um, and how can we use that to be more comfortable with destabilizing reality in our real lives. But I don't know how much sense that makes because Baudrillard is like really hard to communicate, especially in a couple of minutes. Mm. I love that. And I also like the idea, you know, I think the show itself even does that when she'll be like previously on WandaVision. And then you're like, that's actually not what I saw previously on WandaVision. In fact, I think we, we watch it as a family. So every Friday night we like get food and we watch WandaVision. And my one kid got up and he was like, oh, it's cool. I was like, no, no, you need to watch this. It's actually not what previous, she changes it. She changes it. And when, you know, Wu comes through and it's like, who's doing this to you, Wanda? And it's like, she, it's this, I, I think that the show itself does a nice job of putting into 
images the words that you're trying to say, you know, that conception of reality and that reality shifts and she creates it and it creates her to the extent that she then has children <laughs> in this show. That was so much better. Thank you, Marie. You're amazing. <laughs> there's a, um, there's a, oops, I didn't mean to pull up my own comment. Here's the one I meant to pull up. I, I, there's a good comment here about, and how we can use humor in our own lives as a tool for dealing with this comfort, which for sure was, um, in the show. And she, the preceding comment was about how comedy covered it up. Wanda used the laugh track and end credits to cover up vision, trying to break through her reality. And so yeah, I thought that was, that was really interesting. Now, now as the Moors, we, we kind of like talk about Wanda as being, this kind of more evil character, right? Like we're uncovering her. It starts to make me think more about Vision's role, like, right? You see Vision very positively. Now I'm like, oh no, is Vision just an enabler, right? Is he just enabling? Even though he brought questions up in the end, he's like, okay, let's fight for it. We're here. Let's continue the colonization of this town, you know. But that and that's not what he was saying to fight for. But um, <laughs> so it's interesting. Does do other people? So this is this is really great. That, do other people want to talk? I mean, that's so I could see like where you do like a you look at these things and you ask students like, okay, so what do we need? I, I think starting with the show, I guess is what I would say is the bat is really good with students because then you can figure out what they want to learn more about without kind of ruining their interest. So like if they're like, yeah, I'd like to learn more about 50, 60, 70 sitcoms and critiques of those narratives and ways to think critically about it, then we could as teachers go find the things, right? I think the mistake maybe would be to try to divide design the WandaVision curriculum for students, right? As opposed to doing it like the other direction. Um, so what are some other some other aspects of the show that we could explore with students uh, in that way? I was definitely thinking about Vision this morning. And like you said, he was just like, hmm, okay, I know you have to do what you have to do for everybody else. Okay, let's just go home. Because he finally, she made, she made vision from her thoughts and memories and he finally connected her pain. So he was like, okay, I don't wanna put you in any more pain. Let's just go. Yes, he questioned her, but he kind of let that go in the end. And so with students, I feel like you could relate that to, um, I lost my train of thought. Just how do people criticize and critically reflect um, the the injustices in this country. Does that make sense? So for example, you know, I saw so I'm a PhD student at UNT and a lot of my work centralizes around pre-service teach uh, queer and trans pre-service teachers. So I'm always looking at who's missing from the story. And so recently, you know, the equity, the equity, the equity act was just passed. And people are like, well, you know, trans, trans rights erase women's rights. So it's like, people are looking at how it affects them. I don't know, I don't, I'm going somewhere. I'm not making sense. But how can students critically reflect on, it's not a binary of right and wrong. It's a, I don't know the word. I was thinking about something, but then dude is out here on his motorcycle, so. <laughs> A I always think of it as a spectrum, Danelle. I don't know if that's helpful, right? It's a, a, thinking of things along a spectrum as opposed to a binary. Yes, that's the word. Thank you. My uh, my colleague actually teaches a class called Modern America in which they, um, they look at decades. And so they're in the 50s. And so he kind of like lays out like, here are some major things that are going on. Uh, what do you all want to get into? Um, and so he picks, like, he generates the list, they come up with the, what they want to learn about, and then he also peppers it with, like, actually sitcoms, movies, and then they critique it all, and so they have, like, a project at the end of every decade, and they move on to the 60s, and then to the 70s, and et cetera. So it's interesting, like, a show like this would actually fit really perfectly into his curriculum if he chose to do that, because then he could really see, like, you know, the, the modern critique of that, which would be kind of fun. He's also one of the people who I talk about the show quite a bit with. So I don't think this has uh, not been on his mind. I had too many negatives there or just enough. I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to say this to bring Dan into the conversation. I think we should talk about the geography of WandaVision. <laughs> so, and that she start, and I, I said a little bit about this before, like she, you know, she, 
I get the backstory about why she chooses sitcoms, right? And that that's sort of been a, a place of comfort for her. But it also says something that she goes back to 1950s small town, you know, suburbs, I guess new suburbs at the time, right? And we were talking about the ways that that sort of like entraps you a little bit. So I'm, I'm just saying that because Dan, you've been facilitating us, but I think that you might, you should talk about that a little bit. Well, so, so one thing I've done in my classes is, you know, I think so often, again, we, we determine curriculum and then we tell students here, learn this, right? And one thing I've tried to teach in social studies, especially like elementary social studies, but really all is I want students to develop like a critical curiosity about the world, right? A curiosity, but also a curiosity geared towards justice. And so I often use the idea of so there's a social studies of everything. And so when you think of a social studies of one division, right, you could look at the, let's look at the history of one division, you could, which can have many facets, right? There's many lines. You could look at actually the MCU, but you could also look at the history referenced in the show and study and learn more about those things. Geography of one division and economics of one division, which Michael brought up earlier, right? But and again, it's like the economics of the sh what's happening in the show and the economics of MCU, right? How are they profiting off of all this, right? I was listening to the new rock stars uh, video feed, which is one of the ones that kind of updated me on all the things I didn't know. It's they, it's incredible. They do a really good job, and they talked about right, yeah, like how were some of the plot decisions you know, geared towards, you know, media profit decisions, right? That they save things because of that, not because of great storytelling, which maybe that's another way that, that you know, te television media is spectacle, unlike, you know, like a book when I don't think somebody would necessarily make that. I don't know, maybe like Da Vinci Code did that. I don't know. Um, and then, so yeah, and then like the civics of WandaVision, right? And there's all, in the MCU, there's all, you have the Sokovia Accord. You have all these other places where they figure out how do we navigate, like, you know, um, making political decisions and things like that. So with the geography of WandaVision, you know, I, I've gone back and forth on it, uh, Marie, because I'm not sure if it's, I've, initially I thought it was suburbs, right? I thought this is just the suburbs. Then I'm like, it's kind of actually a small town and when they walk, they actually can walk to from their house to the downtown. And there's only 3000 people in the town. So now I'm like, maybe it's it's actually not a suburbs. Maybe it's more of a small town. Um, but I was very curious and I couldn't help but notice, you know, the time when Monica or sorry, when Wanda expels Monica for the first time. And if you watch the next episodes, like she says, oh, she had to rush home. And then in the in the later episodes and Andrew Swan, who's in the comments, said he didn't notice uh, the changes between in a later episode. It actually shows her saying she didn't belong here. And to me, that was a really interesting because, you know, the Levittown suburbs were literally created as white segregation spaces, um, not only like by literally, uh, you know, making it so, so, you know, black and brown folks couldn't move into the neighborhood, but it's by design. If you look at suburban design, there are not through streets. The point is to have cul-de-sacs where only our family can access this. And you go to certain parts of town, uh, you know, um, Danelle, there's, I, there's one of my friends lives in what's I call, what I call the, the dark desert um, because there's no public transportation and wealthy people didn't want it. And I one day went to his house by that way and I had to walk on on you know grass by the street there's no sidewalks there's no there's no way through i can't go into the neighborhoods and walk through the streets because they all end so the whole point is to create geographically create segregations and of course highways have been used to do that and destroy black communities and things so i thought there was yeah thinking of like kind of wanda as like um, i don't even know if she has any white feminism aspects but just as kind of like a white woman here who then expelled Monica. I couldn't get over that. And the MCU, you know, this is a very, a pretty diverse town, small town. And I was curious how many small towns look like that. And what does that do when the MCU kind of diversifies it? But the reality is oftentimes very different that small towns become places that are more uh, intolerant, but maybe, I don't know. May I, it also made me question whether I needed to ask more questions about understanding the diversity of small towns. Maybe I don't under, I don't know enough. So so yeah, that I was thinking about all of that a lot about the geography of and why they chose a small town, right? You couldn't have done this in a big city, right? Like you couldn't have, 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 have like pardoned it off in the same way and the hex would have had to control too many people. So does that work in small towns too, right? That that you can pardon off in the beliefs and, and views of the world and the way people are allowed to control things and control people is more, you're more able to do that in those spaces. I don't know. So I have, lo I have lots of questions and no answers. So thank you for 
<laughs> putting me on the spot with that one because I'm still, but that's what I'd like to explore with students. And I always say in my classes, the best questions to explore with students is ones you don't know the answers to yourself because that creates a real learning environment. It creates real curiosity and it's fun for you. And that energy bleeds into kind of into the classroom. So what, I, what other ideas do we have? We've got about 13 minutes left, just kind of an eye on time. What else do we want to talk about? Do other people have some, some ideas that they wrote down that they, they want to kind of think about how what this means potentially for doing this in school? I don't know if it's in an actual class, if this is a club, right? I think clubs would be even like, and it's funny how when you think of doing it in a club, it sounds more fun. And then it always makes me question, wait, why is it not fun in you know the classroom, right? It's like we, we have a real freedom to learn outside of school. Why do we not have that inside school? Um, standards, I guess, is one of the many answers. Um, well, what do you all think? I did get an answer to my question about uh, who pays them. Apparently, uh, this is from David Dutro. Uh, it was uh, Tony Stark pays all the Avengers, which is fascinating because he's like a billionaire who owns, who pays the, the, the superheroes. Like, I, I don't know if that sits well with me. Um, well, and I, I also have a critique of Tony Stark as a very Elon Musky, you know, Mark Zuckerberg type character of like, you know, white tech guys having this undue power that's like not regulated. Um, Bezos too, right? You can throw all of them in. So yeah, that's, it's an interesting critique because they get to make things inside how the world should be when in reality, these should be public decisions, right? Well, and that's a nice little segue. Uh, David asked a question in the chat here, I noticed about whether Wanda deserved to be able to wield the moral su superiority to trap Agatha in Westview. And, uh, and I think, Dan, you actually answered that in just this other context. Um, <clears throat> I don't think Tony Stark, I don't think Wanda, I don't think anyone, like if, if you are trying to situ situate yourself in a society with democratic complexity, like I, I don't think how anyone can think that's okay. Like there's a reason we have like, a jury of our peers. Um, with, well, I mean, and we know it often isn't that, but in an ideal world, like we we don't live in a democracy, but we are hopefully striving for the ideals that we we claim we claim to have. So it's um, I find it intensely disturbing because, of course, we're all kind of encaptured by that's not a word but you know what i mean we're all we're all i'll just say captured uh you know by our emotions and she's in that state where agatha attacked her family and had these sorts of things and i think she's unable to separate herself from that situation like and understandably so but but to pivot away from that from a second like one of the thoughts i had is like how great would it be in like a chem or physics class when you're talking about like models of the atom you know, like the electron cloud or the Bohr model or whatever, is to then like look at WandaVision like in these representations of sitcoms, which are representations of a society, which are then creating that reality and just really questioning of like how we are making sense of something that we're taking for granted. Like we're given like a heuristic to help us figure something out, but that heuristic isn't real, but it's creating our real interactions and, and how we're understanding the world around us. There's some other great comments I'm looking at. Uh, Mana says, yes, eat the rich is right. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. Um, Love and then, you, Mana. And then they, they probably all see themselves as Tony Stark too, right? And so I, I think it, it power. Th there's real questions about power in the MCU, right? Um, and we do, it's, it's interesting because I think these are really important civics questions too, right? Um, I often talk with my students about the ways that like presidential elections get so much focus and we expect like, presidents to like, for example, if our person wins to cure and solve things, right, which I think is a very distorted notion of democracy, right, that you're not going to oftentimes, and it's look, you look at our presidents, right, I don't, I haven't seen any like, you know, uh, presidents who've like centered anti-racism and addressing colonialism, right, you're not going to get those things uh, from a president oftentimes, because specifically because of how it often works. So, um, you know, we, that's, and that's, we do that in the curriculum too, by looking for heroes, right? We, we make, you know, Mount, you know, uh, Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks, for example, heroes of the civil rights movement. But we also distort them, we sanitize them, and then we kind of put them on this pedestal. And what it does is I think sometimes m misses the point that these were movements of many, many people, right? And that's how they succeeded, right? Oftentimes the civil rights movement, people, Martin Luther King said, don't do the children's march. Don't do that. Bad idea. And they go, we're doing it. And he goes, okay. Right. Like he was not, it's not like he was just leading. He was following too. 
Um, and, you know, so anyway, there's a whole much more discussed, but the, the idea of heroization in the curriculum um, and making heroes is really uh, problematic because everyone's flawed, right? Like, like, and even, even Martin Luther King sometimes is like, people like go look at the FBI tapes, which by the way, we shouldn't because like that kind of surveillance being used against Martin Luther King's legacy and things like that is highly problematic. But then you go and say, oh, look, he's flawed. So this doesn't work. And so we look for perfect people and perfect people don't exist and they don't make things happen. So I think all of that is really interesting too. So what else, what else, what else can we think about with these shows? What do y'all, what else is interesting y'all? And we could also start to pivot. We've got about seven or eight minutes left. We also could start to talk about what we hope comes from these movies in the future and shows. I think, I, I think there's probably a consensus and real hope that the reason that in someone's mind in the MCU that, that Monica uh, didn't get more of a role is because it's coming. And man, I better, I really hope that it's coming, that she is centered in, in Captain Marvel 2. Um, I just think she's still, I, th I agree with Danelle. I think she could have had a way bigger role in this show too. What do you all think? I didn't like Captain Marvel. It was cute. You know, it's just one of the movies you got to watch because they rushed it between, I think, Infinity War and Endgame. And in Captain Marvel, uh, her friend, I forgot her name, but Monica's mom like they reduced her too. Like, you know, she came in hot and then at the end, just, okay, nothing, you know? And then we learned in this show that her mom helped set up Sword and everything. So will, my, will we see Monica in Captain Marvel too? I can hope, once again, I hope it's not the best friend. Like Monica got real beef with Captain Marvel and I wanna see that play out. Cause uh, Monica is dope. Like if you go read her story and her origin line, like she's dope. And people wanna say, oh, well, she just getting to know her powers. Excuse me, did you see how she saw the energy around uh, fake uh, Quicksilver's neck? And then how she did the bullets and everything? Was it just, I'm gonna feel like I'm gonna do the right thing and save everybody, so here comes the energy through my body? No, she had some kind of thought that went into it. Um, Vision, I knew Vision wasn't going anywhere. He has his memory back and that's another thing. Like Vision and Vision had this chat and then fake Vision said, you remember this? And then white Vision, oh, and disappeared. Where's Vision? Jimmy Woo is golden. Darcy, you know, she's the only thing that, she's the only person, great thing, that came out of Thor 2. I hope they bring her back for more Thor movies. I wish they wouldn't bring Jane back, but here we are. Um, so, you know, you, to connect uh, the curriculum. I feel like students will also need to, at some point, watch Age of Ultron, because that's where this real discussion of morality comes in, because Ultron, he was doing the right thing. Tony Stark felt like he was doing the right thing. I'm gonna create this shield. Um, I'm going to take out everybody from society, and then it feeds into WandaVision. So that's what I want to see. And I'll add on that. I think I think Vision's arc is really interesting, right? I kind of already mentioned it, but like, you know, um, and I'm kind of I actually was like thinking. I saw a couple people mention this: the connection of uh, Vision as this really like human artificial intelligence, right? And I think we have real questions to answer in society about the role of artificial intelligence in in our lives, right? Um, and I've seen some people compare it to 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 bring back Killmonger, except not his his character. But uh, Michael B. Jordan's uh, Amazon Alexa commercial. I don't know if you saw that one, right? Where he's all being hunky and everything like that. But the thing is, is they're really humanizing what is a potentially really problematic artificial intelligence, right? And the way these companies like monetize stuff. So, so it's really interesting. And I thought a lot about Space Odyssey 2001, right? How the computer, sentient computer there, right? So there's these connections about the role of AI in our lives that I don't think we ever get into really in schools, right? We That's like happening and changing. And our, you know, our phones, kids are on their phones that are collecting their data and ignoring them, right? Um, I just, one of our doc students, I, we just got a paper that got accepted questioning the role of Google in schools, which is goes often unquestioned, right? They are, Google is the inventor of surveillance capitalism, right? They made the model, Facebook, Sheryl Sandberg took it to Facebook and now everyone's doing it, just collecting our data. So I think, I think, um, 
yeah, the friendliness of vision, the, the public facing human version of vision is really interesting because it's like, oh, AI can be our friends, not our surveillers, right? Um, so anyway, I think those are interesting questions that we could talk about too. Michael, Marie, what, what do you all, what do you all got for us? What are you thinking? Should uh, um, vision be able to vote? I think that's a, a terrible <laughs> question. But I, I still have a very, inter like personhood and vision is fascinating to me. Like when, is he paying taxes? I, I can't stress how excited I am to discuss that. <laughs> well, um, uh, I, yeah, sorry. Well, it makes it, and it makes me think of a uh, scar. What was um, her, the movie her, if you've never seen that, that could also be another tie into thinking about artificial intelligence. That's a really incredible movie. And guess what? The voice is a Marvel character, right? It's Scarlett Johansson. Is it not right? That does the voice of the AI in her. I think it is her. So anyway, another little connection, but if you've never seen that movie, uh, who's the star? It's, um, uh, Oh, I'm free. I'm free. He's the Joker. What's his name? Joaquin Jack Phoenix. Yes, Joaquin Phoenix. He's, I think he's the star of her. If you've never seen that movie, it's really good to think about our changing relationship with AI. So I thought that was a, so. My, but Michael's with Michael's working on the uh, on Vision's taxes. He wants to audit him. <laughs> Michael's in Vision's taxes, and I am. I'm a casual MCU lover as well. Um, so I have less sort of invested in backstories or comic backstories. And I, I love uh, reality bending and reality shaping stuff. So I'm really, ex which is one of the things again, that I liked about this show and the sort of meta nature of media and reality and Wanda's chaos energy, all that I think is so cool. And I'm, I'm actually really excited for her to do whatever is going to happen with Dr. Strange, even though I still think, I do hope there's some sort of like comeuppance for Wanda based on whatever, ha you know, like I hope that part of what happens is a reconciliation of the ways that she warped reality and enslaved people. And then sort of on a sort of like fun intellectual, just entertainment level, I love bending time space stuff. So I'm looking forward to that. Well, and, and I don't know if we want to come back and talk again. I feel like the, the, the Falcon and the Winter Soldier show is going to be a lot more like the diehard version of Marvel, right? Kind of more like the last scene, the fighting and the stuff like that. Maybe it'll go deeper in plot, we think. But I feel like we're going to get some similar ethical issues in Loki, which is coming out later this year. I feel like, because Loki is a nut. We didn't talk about him like as an, as a, we could have done all probably another segment on him as an evil character, right? And his role. So I think, may, hey, maybe we could regroup if people are, are into some of these other shows. And um, I'm in, I'm in, I'm now, I'm now into the, it's hard to, to think about, like I've like avoided like getting into the comics and now Michael and Donnell have me like really excited. Like, oh, maybe I need to read the comics. And then I'm like, no, I don't have time for that. I already have like too many hobbies and things. But you know, I think, I think the problem is we have to separate our interests from school and our scholarship and these things can come into it, you know? Um, so anyway, I'm, this has been a great conversation. So uh, I hope hope people enjoyed it. We're, we're at an hour. So I think that's a good amount of time for people to listen to us theorize about WandaVision. But um, if you have other ideas where well, there's been so many good comments, if you've been keeping up with the comments, thank you for everyone joined in and add comments. Really, a lot of those were really, really good. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll continue the conversation. We're all on Twitter, I think. And so if you if you follow um, our Twitter accounts, most of us in tweeting out or retweeting things with it. So I'm at Dan Kretka. I don't know if other people want to real quickly just tell us your handle and that way people can find you and follow you. And maybe we can we can add some tweets onto the end of this if everybody wants to share uh, maybe a Twitter account. If you want to, if you don't want to, that's okay too. Uh, I'm at Dr. Evil Academic. <laughs> Do with that what you will. Uh, I wish mine were that cool. I'm at Marie K. Heath. And um, also, while I'm unmuted, thank you for that. This was so fun, the whole thing. So thanks for organizing it and inviting me. I'm at 42 Think Deep. Uh, it's Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy reference. That feels like it feels like the end of a Visions of Education episode now. So. <laughs> make sure to leave a five star review. <laughs> Hey, you can you can like this video, right? That's something you could do. Feel free to share it. This video, by the way, does go straight up. Uh, Danelle, do you want to share any contact info? Uh, yes, I'm at G underscore X. I didn't feel like spelling out my last name uh, all the way. So there we go. 
and she's got it right there. And so yeah, you can, if you uh, uh, wanna share this with other people, please share the video. This immediately goes up and it will just be on YouTube at the exact same link and address so people can see it there. So, all right, like, uh, I guess like white vision, we're out of here. So thank you everybody for, uh, for joining us.